Thanks so much for joining us for uh, our Meet the Influencers panel. This is the second of four great panels we're going to share with everybody today. Um, we have a truly excellent group of creator panelists here with us today that are going to share all sorts of great insights about how to create valuable brand partnerships. Um, this session was going to be about 45 minutes. We might have to cut it a little bit short now, but um, we have a few prepared questions. But um, as audience members, if you all have uh, things that you would like to ask our panelists, please um, use the Q&A function here um, and we'll try to get to them throughout. Um, so yeah, let's kick things off with a little round of intros. Um, Bobby and I will we'll go first and then we'll uh, kick it over to our panelists. So um, my name is Sarah Korab. I'm the Director of Influencer Marketing at Savan Social. Um, we have been working with influencers since about 2009, back when they were just called bloggers. <laughs> um, and uh, you know the industry has evolved a lot over that time and it's been really wonderful to be a part of it and to see it grow. Um, so I'll kick it over to Bobby. Hey, yes. Uh, my name is Bobby Long. I am the campaign and account, man account manager at uh, Savon Social. And we're just so happy to have all of you here. Sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's start with Stella. Hi, my name is Stella Williams. I am an unapologetic content creator and I'm the owner of Hot Girl Goods. Amazing. What about you, Tila? Hi, I'm Tila and um, I'm a digital content creator and now brand owner. Um, and then I donated today um, to the Vegan Outreach, which is working to end violence towards animals. Oh, thank you so much, Tila. We really appreciate that. And congrats on the new business. Thank you. And Blake, <laughs> yeah, of course. And Blake, how about you? Yeah. Hey, I'm Blake. I'm a content creator and I'm also the chief evangelist of Lumanu, which is a company helping build tools for creators. And Blake, Amazing. what was the, the charity you selected? No Kid know. Hungry. Yeah, No Kid Hungry, helping uh, solve the uh, childhood hunger problem in America. Great. Stella, Great. what's your charity? I know we skipped over that with you. It's okay. So the charity I chose is called Everybody Deserves Love, and I love them because they have a mission to spread body positivity within teenagers um, up to young adults. Let's kick things off. So starting with our first question, very basically, how as creators do you all go about finding campaigns and brands to work with? Is it going through, you know, networks or other apps? Is it direct relationships and outreach? How, how do you all go about it? Um, and Stella, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Reaching out with brands, I usually post to stories. That's probably the easiest way because I genuinely love the product and I would absolutely love a collaboration. Um, so just trying products on my own and then posting about them usually creates a good relationship and indirectly creates direct relationships with the brand. And those are always the best. Also platforms like Aspire IQ um, and definitely email communication from brands directly is probably my biggest source of new collabs. Cool. How about you, Tila? I love what Stella said, and I think that's really amazing because it's really keeps everything authentic. Um, but uh, I guess it depends on your experience as a creator. I think that the apps that connect brands and creators together can be super beneficial, but um, I think more so if you're beginning to do content creation um, because the, the budget isn't always an experienced budget. <laughs> so um, the apps can be super, super helpful. Um, and then I usually go through email, um, email or DMs. And um, I find that to be helpful, connect with the brand, tell them, hey, I love, I love your product or I love your service and why you love their service or the product. Um, and then suggest working together. And how about you, Blake? Yeah, DMs and emails are, are definitely um, a way to get in. One of the more uh, creative ideas I had that seems to work, work really well is actually mentioning the product mentioning the brand in your story. Um, that's a great way to, to get their attention, to show them, hey, uh, like I'm not just a creator, but I really genuinely love your product. Um, so that's one way to get in. And then I also um, have been utilizing LinkedIn. I think that's sort of a lesser talked about way to, to get in touch with those, those contacts. Right on. Yeah, um, there's a common thread there, uh, you know, actually like trying a product out and then just organically tagging them. Um, that's something that Tiffany mentioned too in our keynote address earlier. So. Um, yeah, that certainly sounds like a, a great way to, to get on a brand's radar. Moving on, uh, so what makes a, a campaign compelling for you to work on and compelling for your audience? Um, and Tila, how about you? You want to go first? I think it comes down to just 
staying true to who you are, being authentic, you know, you're, you're going to be more passionate to talk about a product or a service or an experience if it's something that you can relate with. So first of all, ask yourself, you know, is this relatable to me in my lifestyle, in my life? Is this, is this something my audience can connect with? Um, and try out the product, where it, where, whether it's a product or a service or an experience, try it out first and give your honest feedback. Because like Tiffany was saying earlier, like when you love something, you want to tell everyone about it. You want to tell your friends, you want to tell your next door neighbor, you want to tell everyone, you want to share about it and you're passionate about it. So um, definitely try the product um, and giving, giving feedback about it. And then asking your audience being like, hey, did you try this? What do you think about it? Getting honest feedback. And that helps the brand as well in the end by, you know, getting honest feedback from both you and your audience. Oh, that's so great, Tila. That's very, very authentic. <laughs> I think that we really appreciate that online these days. I think and, what uh, Tila is saying about um, asking your audience is super important because it's a community. The more of a community you built, the more like they'll purchase products and things like that. And just building a good rapport with your followers because it, it returns into a mini community. Um, for me, what makes a campaign extremely compelling is one, obviously loving the product. We all probably know our audience really well and what they, what they do want and what they don't. So I think from that perspective, it makes it easy to choose campaigns. Um, but also when brands come with an appropriate budget, I feel like someone who's like myself, who's just maybe a bigger girl and more a minority. I've had to fight for years, like two, three years ago, the budget really wasn't as understood as it is today. Like there's base bottom lines um, and now I feel like it's really understood and it feels great to be paid fairly and also to enjoy the com uh, to enjoy the product and then you just want to keep working with the company because it creates a really good relationship that there's no complaints you don't um, feel the stress about working and it's so I think it's wonderful yeah, I think one of the things that um, makes a campaign compelling for me is when the brand offers some freedom in the creative um, as a really creative person I really appreciate and and value having freedom with what I'm going to be making. You know, some brands will hit me up and they'll say, hey, you know, we're looking for this very specifically, you know, do this in the video and make it this long. And um, I, I have the most fun when I'm just creating and being my most creative self. So freedom in the creative is something I always look for. And I'll tend to gravitate towards those um, campaigns that offer me that freedom and sort of uh, shoot down some of those other ones that might be a little too specific sitting in between brands and content creators. When we have a, a brand come to us with a lot of restrictions and guidelines and things, um, the content often isn't as compelling as it could be. I love it when a brand doesn't have a lot of those, you know, kind of guardrails um, and we just allow people to, to create something very authentic to them. Um, and I love reading those posts and seeing, um, yeah, seeing all those posts when they come in They're they're, yes, yeah, just so much better when people are allowed to, you know, make something that's true to themselves. So I very much agree with that. So similar, and we kind of touched on a couple of these things um, in the last question, but what makes a brand really great to work with? Like, what do you look for in a brand that you, you partner with? Also, um, what makes a brand challenging to work with? Blake, do you want to kick it off? What makes a brand easy to work with and what makes a brand challenging to work with? What makes a brand really easy to work with is when uh, they pay on time, right? They have a really um, natural, easy way to get in touch with them, to communicate. Um, some brands sort of put up a wall in order to talk to like the person you're trying to get in touch with. So the collaboration, making that easier, something Lumanu helps with. Um, but also on the flip side, what makes a, a brand challenging to work with can be, you know, when they're not paying you on time and you have to follow up over and over. I've dealt with so many late and missing payments. Um, but also, um, you know, keeping the communication solid, keeping the payment solid. Um, I, I'm on a texting relationship with some of the brands that I work with, which are the coolest types of relationships. Um, but I, I think it, it comes down to communication and, and getting paid on time. That'll make me continue to work with those brands over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. Nobody loves when you create something, especially quality like you three, and then you don't get paid on time or you don't feel appreciated. And then the long-term relationship is just, you know, it's cut short when it didn't have to be and your audiences uh, really respect you all. So I'm sure that's a great loss for them. And Tila, how about you? I love working with brands that, that are inclusive and progressive. 
and show diversity. Um, you know, it's, it's really nice to, there's, there's a couple of brands that I've worked with for a couple of years and it's really nice because you start to grow as a family and you create together and you grow together. And it's awesome because, you know, some of these brands that I work with, I, I love them like wholeheartedly and I, I love what they're doing and they're giving back and they're amazing people. Um, and we, you know, we, we've talked about this, but creative freedom. I love being able to just be true to who I am. So having the creative freedom to be like, they're like, yo, we trust you, do whatever you want. That, that feels really good. And it makes, you know, my job more fun. It makes it more fun for all of us to be able to just create how we see something, how we view something. So I think that's really special. Um, challenge, challenges working with brands. Um, I think uh, I've worked with a few that have micromanaged certain, um, certain shoots or, you know, um, wanted me to kind of go outside of being who I am. And I think it's really important for a brand to understand too, that when you reach out to creators, um, you're reaching out to a person because you like their content. You, you think that they vibe with your brand. And I think that's super important to let them do their thing because you reached out to them for a reason. So, um, and like Blake said, you know, pay on time payments. And I, I can swear by this, like, Lumanu has changed the game for me from invoicing to getting paid on time. I, I, my business runs differently now. So, um, yeah, getting paid on time for sure was one of them. And then micromanaging and not having creative freedom was definitely, has definitely been a challenge that I battled. Can I piggyback off the, um, what was the last thing you said to you? I'm sorry, I blanked for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about the creative, uh, creative freedom and then uh, being paid on time. Oh yeah. So create, oh, the micromanaging. So that's what we were talking about. Oh my goodness. Nothing irritates me more than a brand knows exactly what I post and it's doing great. And they think those numbers are going to come by doing exactly how they want it. That doesn't fit my brand. Um, and it's just, it's an interesting thing. It's like, it's like a battle that doesn't need to be had. Um, there are plenty of other creators. If I'm not a fit, like you want the numbers, but if I'm not a fit, it's okay. Go pick someone else. This won't work. It's fine. Um, but definitely the micromanaging and then the communication. And I'm not just talking payment. I'm talking about when can I get my brief? Um, okay. I sent you the draft three days ago. I was supposed to post this two days ago. Now my whole schedule's off. Like, what are we going to do about this? I'm not hearing from you. Those are probably the most irritating because we do, a lot of us run on schedules. And if we're not able to post, I know a lot of brands have clauses about you can't post another video for three days after you post ours, um, things like that. And then if there's no communication and, and everything gets pushed back and it just messes up other relationships we have. So um, definitely the negatives, positives about brands, again, open communication, open to creative concept. They know exactly who I am and what they're getting. And they often respect it um, because it works for what I do. And um, I don't know. I just love brands that just get me. It just makes it so much easier. It's fun. I think that's what's missing from a lot of brand deals because sometimes they're like, you're like, we're not models for your brand. We're influencers, creators, creating content for our own like platform. So there's a difference there that I think sometimes that line gets a little messy. Wow. That is such a good point, Stella, truly that line between like, you're not just a model, like this is, this is who you are and you're, you're utilizing me and like my mini family or in your case, a pretty yeah. big and dedicated family. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about what you guys do when they when a brand comes to you and it, it's just not the right fit for your brand and your vibe? Like um, how do you handle those situations? So I literally just say, hey, I took a look at your website or I saw your Instagram. It's not a good fit. Um, thank you. And I, I usually just move on from there. And they're like, okay, if anything changes in the future, reach out. And then it's just move on to the next email. Agreed. I'm there too. Um, and there's a lot of brands, like every creator is going to get the brand that reaches out to just collaborate or, or for trade. And I, you know, unless it's something that's, you know, for the better good or charity or, you know, of, of that case, I, I tend to, to not, um, not take trade collaborations because, you know, a lot of work goes into, you're, you're basically your own production agency. You're, you're, you're finding, scouting your locations. You are, you know, scouting a photographer or getting a photographer, you're putting together wardrobe or whatever, you're your own production. So a lot of work goes into creating and bringing this vision to life. So um, when people, email me about or brands email me about that sort of um collaboration 
I'm just like, you know, I not at this time, but, um, you know, just handle it, handle it really nice and say, you know, it's, it's not the good fit for sure. It's important to turn down things that you're not interested in respectfully, mm -hmm. but there's also sort of the flip side to it, which is keeping the doors open. I mean, whoever's on the other side of that email, whether it's kind of a crappy offer or not, um, it's important to be respectful and, you know, keep in mind that the possibility of that same person working for an even bigger brand for bigger collaborations for higher paying gigs um, is very real. So I always like to keep the relationship going. I'll even check in on some people who, you know, might have been hitting me up when their brand was first kicking off. Maybe they're doing great. Maybe they're doing $5 million in sales a year and they have a little bit of budget to spend. So definitely keep the relationships open, I, I find is, is really um, valuable. Yeah, from my perspective, again, sitting between brands and influencers, when somebody lets me know that something just isn't quite, you know, the right fit for their brand, and they're maybe like a little worried that that's going to like negatively impact their, um, you know, they're saying about getting a campaign again in the future, it, it couldn't be farther from the truth. If somebody, if it's not a fit for you and your audience, like it's not going to be good for you, for your audience, for the brand, for anybody involved. So um I actually really appreciate it when people are, are candid and let me know that rather than just taking a campaign because of the payment or whatever the case is. That, so, that's yeah. so true. A real life example of that um, is Celsius. Like I was a huge fan of the Celsius energy drink and they were only willing to give me product for many months and I would follow up with them. Um, and eventually I landed like a, a, a year long deal. It was my biggest deal at the time. And so that was just a perfect example of a product I really loved um, I got in contact with them because I tagged them for free. That was my in through the door. Then they started sending me the product and then I would follow up. And that's sort of the, the journey that it took me um, to get to that point of, you know, winning over a, a win, a, a year long win. Let's roll to the next question here. So, and I'm gonna have you start us off, Stella. Um, we're gonna hear about it a little bit more in the, the brand panel, which is coming up next in the um, agenda, but um, a lot of brands um, previously looked at influencer marketing as a, a way to get a lot of awareness. Um, and a lot of brands still look at it to, to gain a lot of awareness for their brand and their product. But a lot of brands also are looking at it as a way to drive sales. Um, so when you're working on a campaign and the goal is sales, um, what are some tactics that you employ or how, how do you get your audience to shop, like to take action? So this is basically all of what I do coming from fashion. Um, obviously, then with the clothes sold and then the branches from there. Um, the more I'm in love with it, the more I'm going to talk about it, the more I'm going to hype it up. And that makes my girls excited. So it's really a chain effect, especially from YouTube videos, because the genuine reactions I have to products, they're undeniable. Someone else wants to feel that experience. They want to have that feeling. They want to get it in the mail and be like, oh, my gosh, I feel the same way Stella did. So um that way and then um tracking links I don't know if that's kind of on par of what you were talking about but um yeah just driving sales being very excited about products and mentioning them outside of the scope so if I really just like am all about your product um I will throw in stories for free I'll be like look this I'll tell my people this isn't even sponsored this part like sure I did a YouTube video for them but this Instagram story is not even sponsored or this reel is not sponsored um but you have to get this there's no questions about it um and I'll cross promote on TikTok or other platforms just because I believe in that and obviously that helps my relationship with the brand because it's like oh well she's giving us stories or a TikTok for free or whatever again and it goes back to that like really healthy ecosystem that you create with a brand um and it just it's like a big circle if you drive the sale you're excited drives the sales they come back it's just a big circle it's great <laughs> i can definitely attest to stella she was posting about some biker shorts on your story and you had like nine pair and i was like i have to go in i have to i have to see what this is about <laughs> and i about bought these biker shorts so you're very good at it and i had to I had to let you know that it works for you. And uh, how about you, Blake? I, I think that driving sales is so important. Um, but as a creator, I don't like to think about that, right? I want to make the, the best possible content. So I would say for brands out there, it's important that you're compensating your creators for the time and the effort that they put into making the content solely. If you want to give them an affiliate a deal or an opportunity to earn extra income, um, from the content or from the sales. I think that's awesome too. Um, and I love what Stella said about uh, dropping in some, some value bombs there because that's, that's just gonna you know, make your relationship that much stronger with the brand. But I, I'd say 
I don't focus quite as much on the sales. I just want to create a really solid story because at the end of the day, the content that I'm creating could be used for brand awareness and not sales directly. Um, so that's sort of my, my angle, my take. Absolutely. And Blake, I, I'm sure that you just create this content because you're compensated for it. And that just automatically will bring the sales in because it is that authentic voice. So um, that's really amazing. And Tila, how about you? I mean, I, I agree with both Blake and, and Stella. Um, I, I think genuine excitement, which rolls back to being authentic and, and genuine about a product or, you know, a service um, uh, is, is, is what gets people excited. You know, like I, I have this lipstick that I have and I always wear it and I tell everyone, this is the best lipstick that I've ever worn. It doesn't, it doesn't move. I can eat tacos. It's not going to come off genuinely it's, it's like, I'll, I'll brag about it, you know? Um, so it like genuine excitement about a product. Um, I also, it, it may sound kind of cheesy, but I, I love a good discount code. Like that's going to reel me in. If I see a product that I like and there's like a discount code, I'm going to use it. Cause I like my deals, you know? Um, and, and I've had a lot of people message me lately about, there were some bags that I was, I was, um, shooting and they were like, yo, thank you so much for the code. Uh, like it really came in handy. Like I'm really stoked about it. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that's a, a good way to generate sales, but I love what Blake said too, just about, you know, the, the joy and the authenticity about just creating and, and, and spreading brand awareness. I think that's, that's super real and, and special. And I think that's going to drive sales naturally for sure. They yeah. piggyback off the codes. Mm -hmm. So, so important. Like if my girls are like, oh, there's no code, they'll literally just like move on. And so they're <laughs> very, very, very important. <laughs> we love our deals. <laughs> Stella, I was going to ask, um, we, when we talked earlier, um, you mentioned a campaign that you worked on where there was like a limited quantity of something or a, there was a time limit around something. Can you talk a little bit about that for the brands and the audience and about how that was, how effective that was? Sure. So um, I'm assuming you're talking about the clothes closet. <laughs> um, that was over the weekend. I worked with a small influencer who started a curated thrift store of influencers clothes. And it was, it was supposed to launch Monday and pre-sale, I guess was Sunday. And I was so excited. I was like, guys, tomorrow we're dropping all these clothes on the site. Like it's so exciting. Like tomorrow I'll give you a discount code and whatever. Um, and then it ended up just like selling out on pre-sale day. We didn't even get to promote it until after it was all gone. And I I guess I didn't think about that. I probably should have done that Monday because she's like, oh yeah, we'll promote on Monday. But that was just such an awesome experience between a smaller brand and um, myself just to have that experience together of just, I'm so excited. Um, this is exactly what my followers have been asking for since at least September and what we're in June. So it was something that was highly anticipated and it was awesome. So we're going to change gears a little bit here. And uh, this was a question that just came up organically, like when we were talking um, last week. So a lot of times where I'm hearing that influencer and creator are being used interchangeably. Like this is an influencer marketing summit. We're calling everybody creators, sometimes influencers. How do you guys feel about those terms? Yeah. How do you feel about them? Tila, you want to go first? Sure. I, I used to use the word influencer. I, I tend to go more towards like creator or digital content creator now. Um, and, you know, I, cause that's what we are, you know, we're doing this for, I don't know, the last seven years. Um, it's, it, it's just shown me and I know so many other creators out there that, you know, there's a lot of time and effort. Like I said, you are your own production. You are your own business that goes into creating these visions and bringing them to life. You know, whether you're, you're creating um, like literature or photographs or change or awareness, like you are creating something. And I think that's, um, I, I guess I prefer to use creator, um, but I think that people are definitely influenced by the people, you know, that they follow and that they, they support on social media. So I think, you know, it's always good to be a, a positive role model for sure. But um, yeah, people are definitely influenced I'm influenced all the time. <laughs> I love that. And Stella, I know that when we talked last uh, week, you had a bit of a different perspective on the word content creator and influencer. Can you share uh, with us about that? Sure. So just based on like how I run things, it's not, I'm not a very curated content creator. I don't um, like have a feed aesthetic. I, that's just not my route, I guess. Um, partly because I'm not that creative to do that. So I struggle with the term content creator. Um, 
the creation part is what gets me. And there's no, there's an undeniable amount of influence that I do have on my audience. And that's why I feel very comfortable with the term influencer publicly, even on my profile, you'll see unapologetic content creator, just because that's probably more a socially accepted term at this point. Um, but I don't create content that would be like cinematic or to this like super, super high quality level of like, like obviously I use high quality cameras and you know, everything looks aesthetically pleasing, but to the sense of like it being like a movie and just very creative in a sense of something I just don't have, I kind of own that. And I just think my authenticity and the influence I have kind of trumps something I just wasn't with. So I just kind of work with what I got and it's working out. <laughs> Sarah, you mentioned, um, you know, you started doing this seven years or 10 years ago, back when they used to call it bloggers. And I think we're starting to see this shift from, you know, blogger was like 1.0 and then influencer is like 2.0, where we realized that the bloggers writing content actually had a lot of influence on the people around them. And now I think that we're shifting into this 3.0 of creator where the economy is realizing that creators are real businesses. They deserve to be treated like businesses, but they are, we are our own distribution, our own broadcasting station. Um, and there's a lot of power in that. And so for me, the word creator is, is really empowering. I'm, I'm really excited to see the, the shift to 3.0. I also think creator is a very like all encompassing term as well. So like there, there are still a lot of people who have blogs and who distribute that content through Instagram and Facebook and every, everywhere else. Um, so yeah, I, I like that. It, it's a pretty all inclusive thing. And, you know, let's see coming up. Uh, I think we only have a couple, couple more questions. And then there are a couple that came in through the Q and a, so we'll finish our prepared ones first, but how do you guys feel that the pandemic affected the way that you guys work with brands? Like what, what shifts or trends have you seen in, in the campaigns you've been asked to work on over like the, the last 15 months? Um, Blake, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Wow. The past year. Um, I think that I, I've seen a lot of legacy brands sort of pause or drop off for a bit, but for the most part, it's picked up a lot for, for me. I mean, I got to, I had the opportunity to grow my TikTok. I didn't have a TikTok a year ago. Um, and I did like 100 million views, which was crazy. And that alone had opened up so many opportunities for me, including the Celsius one that I mentioned earlier. Um, so in terms of working with brands, I think, I think it's, been, it's been bullish. I'm bullish on, on influencer and, and brands in uh, 2021. Congratulations, Blake. That's I'm some pretty impressive numbers. <laughs> you too, I, Bobby. Um, You've been crushing it on TikTok, Bobby. <laughs> yeah. For anybody that doesn't know. I, um, I'm also, I'm an influencer and I follow all of them as well. And I do have to agree with the whole TikTok thing. Like I was just posting at noon every day and then suddenly the views are just crazy and the opportunities definitely roll in. Like it's, it's sometimes unbelievable how quick things can change. And, um, that's why you have to stay optimistic and just, uh, I'm learning a lot from you guys though. You guys are better influencers than me. <laughs> Do you Bobby, how? Oh, I was just gonna ask Bobby really quickly. How have you um seen, like, the, I know that you're doing a lot on TikTok. How how has that affected like your Instagram stories? Like, have you been able to transfer that content, um, or how how is that working for you? Oh, like uh, as opposed to TikTok, I just think that like TikTok has grown so much, and I've just been able to funnel it to Instagram. Like, I wasn't really. I would say like big on Instagram and then the pandemic hit and then um, like I grew my TikTok so much that it just funneled over and then like the opportunities just run in if that answers your question. Yeah. So um, yeah, I don't know. The pandemic definitely was hard, but also a good thing in my uh, perspective as opposed to like my uh, business <laughs> pursuits on the side of marketing. So uh, Tila, did the pandemic help you or did you find that a little bit hard? Cause I know you do a lot of things kind of in person and you work with a lot of photographers. You create very like high quality, like production style. <laughs> so hats it, off to you. First, and I think that brands were trying to navigate, okay, no one was expecting the pandemic. Um, what do we do now? You know? So um, I did see like a lot of like e-com brands and brands that I've worked with, you know, switch over to doing, influencers and, and digital creators. And I, I've actually seen them, but those brands do better now. Like a lot of magazines even went digital, you know, we're living in a kind of like a digital world now. So um, it was a little bit slower at first. 
I think while everyone, all of us were trying to figure out like, okay, what do we do now? Um, but I, I'm very grateful that I have, you know, a photographer that I consistently work with who, who understands me and knows my vibe. And, um, you know, we were, we didn't have to see anyone. We just kind of did our work and, and, and got out there and got things done. So, um, it did pick up because brands were starting to be like, okay, cool. This is, this is what we're doing now. More brands. I think, I think brands more than ever now are starting to use, um, social media a lot more and they're seeing how beneficial it is for their business. So, um, I think it's been really awesome. TikTok, like I watch TikToks all the time. I'm not really a TikToker. I, I honestly, I need to be like Tiffany was saying earlier, um, reels has become such a, such an amazing thing now. And I, I really love watching reels because I'm seeing more of someone's personality, you know, at, people are showing more of their personality aside from just like posting photos, which I do. So I'd like to get onto making more reels. Cause I feel like nobody sees my goofy side. You know what I mean? I feel like it's such a great opportunity for your audience to get to know you better. So um, I think 2021 is going to be great. And I think that 2020 was really navigating like what's, what's going to work for brands and creators. And I think it's only going to get better. I, I love what you just said Tila, because I feel like now is the best time to double down on social and we're seeing more and more brands pop up and, and really go in on this. I mean, my amazing partner, Ariel, she quadrupled her social media management business. I think we're seeing more and more brands um, really uh, harness the power of, of social, uh, especially in 2021. Yeah, it's awesome. It's really cool. And I love seeing it and keep making Absolutely. the real start making them. You guys, I'm going to start making them because I love seeing people's personalities. I just love it. It makes me so happy. And I love the photo dumps. The photo dumps are awesome. Like, <laughs> I just did one of them. Genuinely in my everyday life. <laughs> so I think Absolutely. Like, I well, love it's out there now, Tila, we're going to be counting on you. We're going to, we're going to be know. watching for your, for your reels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I feel inspired as well by all of you and just all these different ways to work online. It's, um, really mind opening. Um, and Stella, I know that you work a lot in fashion. How was that in the pandemic? I, I know you mentioned before that, you know, this, we thought that maybe people weren't going to be buying, but that actually was the contrary. Like you probably saw a lot of people like, you know, <laughs> online shopping and how did that work for you and your partnerships with brands? Sure. So we all know quarter one is really, really slow after the holidays and usually not a lot happens after quarter one. Um, and this kind of happened in March. So immediately I didn't even have time to process COVID before contracts came rolling in. I feel like a lot of the companies I work with took advantage of everyone being home bored, thinking it was two weeks of a vacation who want to spend money and definitely think pretty much everyone I've made. I didn't, this, the COVID, the beginning of COVID was the first time I ever got my first like extended contract, like a six month, one year, because I think the brands I work with saw the value in like, oh, stuff's about to change and things we couldn't even process yet. Cause we're like, just trying not to get sick. So, um, it was a whirlwind for sure. And honestly has not stopped since, which I guess for me is a blessing and it's unfortunate how it had to happen, but it's been crazy ever since, you know, they said we're in lockdown contracts are like, okay, people are home, get them to buy stuff. Let's go. Okay, just nonstop ever since. <laughs> right on. So we have about four minutes left. Um, there's one more prepared question. We're just going to do this rapid fire if that's cool. Um, and I think it's important for all the other creators in the audience to hear this from you guys. So what is one tool that you could not run your business without um, that you would recommend other influencers to check out? Um, whether it's like design or video editing or something to help you keep, stay organized or scheduling. Uh, Tila, you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Lumanu, absolutely for invoicing and getting paid on time. Um, uh, Lightroom for editing and Planoly, that has like changed my life because it helps you schedule and and looks at your layout and everything. So it's perfect. Solid. All right, Stella, kick us off. <laughs> One, I didn't even realize I was using Lumanu for two of my contracts and then until yesterday. So I was like, oh, okay. Oh I didn't even realize I was doing it. Okay, um, rapid fire iPhone, um, if you're a new creator and you just like feel overwhelmed by new technology, by computers, by all these, edit you don't need to be perfect to get started. You can become perfect in your own sense of the word, um, but you just need to start. So iPhone, you can edit, you can take a picture, you can do whatever you need to do all with one device. Love it. Amazing. Blake. Blake. 
Great answer. I've been loving Video Leap to edit um, my videos on the fly. I love it. I edit in Final Cut Pro on my computer, so you could call me a pro editor. And Video Leap is so simple, but it still gives me like the flexibility of the tools that I want. And obviously Lumanu to get paid instantly before the brand even pays. So if you're a content creator, check out Lumanu. It's a game changer. Game changer. I mean, we, we all like getting paid on time. So I'm glad that you guys have found, you know, different tools for editing, you know, the basic, you just need an iPhone. And it's just, it's really encouraging to the audience knowing that, you know, you can be a content creator and you don't need all the, the bells and whistles. Like you can just do it and you can get started. And that's really, really inspiring. And we yeah, really you appreciate you guys. Equipment. You can just do it on your own. And it's so, it's, it, it's, it's amazing. Exactly. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Love it. Um, we have one minute. We'll take one quick question from the Q and A. And um, I, we didn't talk about this last week, but what are you guys' thoughts on Clubhouse? Are you using it? How are you using it? Blake, you are nodding. So do you have thoughts? <laughs> sure. Clubhouse is awesome. I've met so many amazing uh, creators on Clubhouse, even met some in person, built some awesome relationships. If you're not on Clubhouse, just get on it and give it a shot. Spend a day, spend an hour. Um, but I've met some really cool people from it. And I think having a, a different sort of mechanism to talk to people by literally talking to people, which is something that the other social uh, platforms don't allow is really unique. So if you're not on Clubhouse, give it a shot. I mean, I've got my favorite window tinting guy in Santa Clarita on Clubhouse. So I think <laughs> there is no reason why any business should not be on Clubhouse. I love it. Um, okay. I have just been like lurking on Clubhouse for several months. I haven't like participated really too much in anything. Maybe we should do a little follow up and uh, I can have you guys, we'll do a little Clubhouse room and, and keep the conversation going. I think that'd be pretty yeah. cool. I, I joined it too, but I, I don't have much experience with it. So um, I, I, I'm down to do a follow-up with that for sure. I okay. need to check it out. Me too. I've been lazy. <laughs> I did see that Sarah joined it though. I was like, I did. <laughs> but uh, what do you for think, Clubhouse, so? For yeah. me, um, I'm just like part of Black Twitter that kind of transitioned to Clubhouse. We were all about it. Um, this is going to sound so bad, but the day they took the um, black guy off the app logo we literally stopped using it and it's just been weird and, and it was also weird because we were using it as like a low-key dating app like just for my culture of where we are in the app it was just not intended for what it needed to be so I think that wasn't great but there are also a lot of awesome rooms of good creatives definitely recommend the app um but the day the logo was changed I can tell you we were all just kind of like we were in there daily and then that happened and we were all like and then we just kind of left. Wow, it. that's an interesting perspective. <laughs> but I'm glad that you all like have some sort of, you know, experience with it. And we'll have to, we'll have to see how it goes. I, I'm interested now. I think a follow up is called for. Cool. So that brings us to the end of our time together. I want to thank you guys so, so much for sharing all of your wonderful insights with our audience. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk with you all. And yeah, have a great rest of your day.